So let's press ahead and talk about the, the next deal. So we, some of you already know how to do numerical integration, some of you might not. So we'll talk a little bit about that today because that is the, the method by which um, these standard <coughs> now standard isoparametric elements have, uh, um, have evolved. Uh, if you're looking for this exact um, piece of page, you won't find it. You'll find the pages before and after it where we left off yesterday. And that's because I own, unless you downloaded this today. So I keep on updating the, um, the file on Angel with this most modern one, most recent one. But I typically add it as depending on how far we get, because I'm just adding these things uh, as, as we go through it. So today we'll talk a little bit about uh, isoparametric elements, just to remind ourselves what's going on. We'll talk about the manner in which they're used. Uh, typically, their use is using numerical integration, because often our interest in these elements is to be able to make elements that have these general shapes, might have mid-side nodes, might have um, curved boundaries. And we talked last time about the fa fact that we can define coordinate systems that <coughs> define these. And we did a very simple one-dimensional example. But these can be applied uniformly uh, and universally to multi-dimensions two dimensions and three dimensions. And so we'll just uh, quickly move through that. So you remember that the matrix we end up with is exactly the same as before. All that's different is that when we get these um, local matrices for uh, mainly for the geometry of the element, the A matrix and the multiplier on the geometry, which instead of being in the x, y, and z directions is in the R, S, and t, unfortunately, right? t is often time, but uh, sometimes this is R, S, and t are the local coordinate systems. And so we expect that both of this A matrix and this determinant of the Jacobian, we've not called it that before, but that's exactly what it is, um, are able to be able to define this change of um, geometry from kind of the global system. We map it onto this one by one length rod in the case of one dimensions or a one by one sorry a two by two length rod or a two length rod minus one to plus one or a two by two a by unit square as it's called which is uh, of area four uh, and I guess in three dimensions it would be a uh, uh, a by unit cube right so two two uh, length of two in each of the uh, spatial dimensions and so we do the mapping and then we talk about mapping it back again, but of course we don't map it back again. Uh, once we've formed it in this format, then we have the solution we need. And so that's kind of what we are attempting to do. We'd expect, of course, that the A matrix is the one that has all of our uh, information in it relating to the coordinates only. Uh, the coordinates both in the uh, x direction, but since the integration we do is in the local coordinate system, then it also has to have some transformations in it that allow it to come from the XYZ coordinate system into this RS and T coordinate system. And so we went through last time and basically showed ourselves how to do that, that we want to relate nodal heads to gradients of heads. They're linked by this A matrix. So if you think about writing this term here out in longhand, then we can do that. And it should, uh, if it maps on a head matrix onto the gradients of heads, then whatever the operator we end up with will actually be the the uh, the A matrix. And so uh, the simplest way is just to take dh dx and multiply by d over dr and then figure out how to get this um, term, which is the reciprocal of the determinant of Jacobian, one over the, the, the determinant of Jacobian, and the other one, which is just the... Um, the gradient, the, the derivative of the shape functions. So, that, so that's what those are. And so those exist in these uh, particular form. So the A matrix is just the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to R, the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to R, and multiplied through by the nodal coordinates. This is this uh, determinant of Jacobian on this side, and this is just the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to R. And once we have that, we have everything we need to be able to put it together. And all of the, the integrations then are in this local coordinate system. 
So that's, that's basically the way it shakes out for a one-dimensional element. So to do this, the, the crux of this is, of course, to be able to, to make this, this integration. And so this integration is trivial in this particular case uh, because it's just this term. You can do it analytically quite easily between these limits. Um, these are all constants, so we don't have to worry about these. <coughs> Um, if we had a shape function, for instance, that wasn't uh, uniform over the element, so if you want to draw the particular shape functions we have, we drew them last time, that they look something, well, they don't look something like this, they look exactly like this, right? They're these two components. This is B1, maybe, and this is B2, and they are these, um, if this is equal to... Uh, zero, and if this is plus one and minus one in terms of R, then these are just the, the these components are going to be what? Um, one, one plus R, I guess, right? Uh, that means when R is equal to, no, one minus one, right? Yeah, so it's minus. And this one is 1 plus r. And you can check that, of course, by just making sure that they make the right magnitude at each of these locations. So this is a location of r equals plus 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2 divided by 2 is 1. And so this is unit height. And so in our, this particular case, the integration is trivial. You can do it analytically. Um, uh, and we don't really need to resort to this. Uh, we could imagine making uh, shape functions which are um, slightly different, which would give us three noted elements, for instance. And all the things that we've talked about here apply to that. And these, have I space, some space to do this? Let me write it here. And so you could imagine, for instance, that you could have an element that would maybe be a, a linear element, but it would have three nodes in it. And so this might uh, typically, I'm not sure what a numbering convention. If we start on the right hand one is one, or I'm just going to look at the no, left hand one is one. And so these would be nodes one, two, and three. And uh, what we want to do is, for instance, be able to map the head at a point as being equal to shape functions multiplied by the, the nodal heads. So this would be, in our particular case, B1, B2, and B3. And in this geometry, the heads that we'd have for this three-noded element would be 1, 2, and 3. So whatever those magnitudes would be. And so we can think about the same, and this actually you can do analytically as well, of course. We'd want to be able to figure out, so the hard part is being able to figure out exactly what the shape functions um, would be. And so we know that there are a couple of requirements. Actually, there are, there are two requirements. Two requirements. We haven't talked about this. The first is that... Um, it has to equal 1 at the node in question. My bad handwriting. But anyway. So in other words, B1 has to equal 1 at node 1. Just like, well, if you switch back, right? That's exactly what we had here, right? B1 is equal to 1 at this node. B2 is equal to 1 at this node, etc. So that's all we're saying by this. So we know that it has to equal 1, one at that particular node. The other requirement is uh, it also has to equal 0 at all other nodes. Not everywhere else, but all other nodes. 0 at all other nodes. So in this case, if this is B1, which it would be, it has to equal 1 here, and 0 here, and 0 here. And the only way it can do that, let me see if I can do this, <laughs> I could use a stool to sit on. 
is it needs to come down through here, it needs to go negative, and back up here. So we could imagine that the shape functions are physically going to look like that, and we could choose what those might look like. So rather than complicate matters, I'll draw the other shape functions below. So again, this is R. B2 is going to satisfy the same deal, right? So this is going to be B2. And to satisfy these two conditions, it's going to look like this. Yeah, Victor? So what are the benefits of using this type of shape functions? Because you can then, in one element, you can get curvature of the variable and curvature of the element as well. Not in this particular case. Um, so for instance, um, you could, uh, if you're looking at the, the pressure distribution over this, this will actually represent a pressure distribution that would look like this. Whereas if you use two linear elements, the pressure distribution would look like straight line, straight line. That's it. And so you could also choose to put this node not at the center, but also closer to the edge, so you could pick up gradients as well. As in this case, right? You have a high gradient here. Okay. And so this one is have, going to have to equal 1 at this point, and so it's going to be equal to this. Not drawing it very well, but you get the idea. This is B3. And typically, these are chosen by that requirement, those two requirements. One at each node individually, and zero at all other nodes. Uh, in transiting it, it means it obviously is non-zero within the element. And so you could actually um, start assembling these uh, shape functions. So I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but I, uh, and I can't remember exactly what the, f the shape functions are. Do I have them here? Maybe I don't have them here. I could, uh, there I do. And so these are, so jumping ahead. So these shape functions are going to be a half, 1 minus r. So I'll come back anyway. Um, and I can't read that so well, but I can blow it up, I guess. So this is a half, 1 minus r. Is that going to be right? And uh, minus a half, 1 minus r squared. So let's, we can start putting them together. So these these shape functions that exist here would be the correct shape functions that we need to use. So actually I can write them here as, as easily as anywhere else I suppose. So another one is B1 is going to be equal to a half 1 minus r minus a half 1 minus r squared. So it's getting a bit more complicated. Um, but if you remember the geometry that we have, it looks something like this. <coughs> so this is node 1. This is r is equal to minus 1. Uh, this is node 2, and this is node 3. So we know that uh, b1 is going to have to equal 1 here and 0 at these other points. So we can quickly test that out, I suppose, by just taking for instance, r is equal to minus 1 at this particular point. So r is equal to minus 1. This ends up being 1 minus 1 is, uh, is 2 divided by 2. So this is 1. And minus 1 squared minus 1 is 0. So this term is null. So this gives uh, b1 is equal to 1 at r equals minus 1. At uh, the central node, we want it to be 0. Let's not do that. Let's do the end node first. So at r is equal to plus 1. Then you can do the calculation from below. Uh, again, well, from this. So r is equal to 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. Uh, 1 minus 1 squared is also 0. So this is equal to 0, as you'd expect. So it satisfies this. And likewise, at this point here, it should be the same. So at r equals 0 in this middle por portion uh, should be. 
which is a half minus a half. So it is indeed equal to zero. And so these functions are often referred to as serendipity shape functions. Serendipity. Serendipity means chance. They're chosen just by chance. Serendipity is a fancy word for chance. Um, and so it means that they're chosen by chance, so they satisfy these two basic characteristics. One at the node in question, and zero is all other nodes. And so long as they uh, satisfy that, then they're fine. So likewise, then, for B2, you can see directly what it would be. This would be now uh, plus... And this is still minus. Yeah, so this only differs by, by this term here. And the third one is just, actually, I think it's just the equation of, is it a parabola? 1 minus r squared. So if you look at what that would look like um, on this. So certainly at r is equal to minus 1, this is going to be 0. Certainly at r is equal to plus 1, it's going to be 0. And certainly at r equals 0, it's going to be equal to 1. So it's going to look like this. I think it actually has zero gradient at the peak, but uh, basically this is, so this is B3. So those, those are the, the element um, functions. So those, uh, if we had those, for instance, you realize, of course, that the, um, the simple term that you have in here is no longer necessarily going to be constant. It's going to be a function of r. Oops, sorry, up here. This is going to be maybe a function of r. Uh, because we're taking the derivatives of this and the derivatives of something that has um, uh, r squared will still have r in it. Right? So at some stage we take d, dr of the shape functions. If the sh these shape functions are functions of r squared, then once you've taken this derivative, then it's still a function of r is left. So these would be functions of r in this particular case. And so the integration isn't quite so straightforward. Uh, and so what's typically used is numerical integration. And numerical integration, um, I imagine you've probably seen it in your past, it's really quite straightforward. Uh, it basically says that if you take a, a function um, of r and you want to integrate it uh, between some limits, then you can do it by doing two things. You can calculate the function at a particular location uh, in its range, somewhere between plus and minus 1, an optimal location. And if you multiply it then by a weighting factor, uh, then you end up with the uh, correct integration. And so it's straight, basically straightforward uh, in that if this function r is some polynomial which has maximum uh, order of k, so if, if it's a linear function, quadratic function, uh, cubic, quartic, quintic, etc., then the order of k allows you to basically determine the order of integration that you have to use. And so if you use quadrature, you get the exact result, not just an approximation, but the exact result. If the degree of the function, which is this maximum value here, uh, is equal less than or equal to 2n two, two minus 1, where this is the order of integration. So in other words, if you use one-point integration, um, then that means that n is equal to 1, so 2n is 2 minus 1. It means it will satisfy a linear function. So one-point integration gives a linear function. And of course, it makes perfect sense that that's the case because you know integration is no different than just doing this. It's taking some function as a function of r. It's easiest if it goes through this, the zero. Um, and this is function of r. And physically, all it's saying is that if we want to do it between this limit and this limit, then the optimal point to sample it for one, one point quadrature would be halfway between this. <coughs> so this is uh, L over 2, and this is L over 2. And so if you calculate the magnitude of this function at this point, 
then the integral of the area under this curve is just equal to taking this part here and physically putting it there. And so if you calculate the magnitude of the function at this point here and multiply it by 2L, and so in other words, in this case, the integral from 0 to L of this function dr is going to be equal to the function evaluated at this point L over 2, whatever it is, and then multiplied this magnitude by the length. And so this would be just multiplied by L. So in this particular case, this L is the, the weight that's applied to it, which is called Hj, and this is the uh, the function, I guess. So all quadrature does is it defines in an optimal way the points where you should sample. It's trivial for this uh, case with just a linear distribution. Uh, if you have a quadratic function, in other words, not something that is a f just linear function of the maximum function of this is 1, right, in this case. So all these other terms are missing in this particular case. If it's a quadratic function, then one-point integration wouldn't do it for you, right? So uh, it only, it's only good up to, to, to linear. So you need to go at least up to two-point integration. So two-point integration would give you 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 3, which it means that two-point integration would be good for what functions? cubic, right? So in other words, k equals 3. So in other words, uh, two-point integration is f 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. So in other words, this could be a, a cubic a cubic function. And you'll get the exact results. So um, I guess I did it with a, uh, just a very simple linear example there. But um, you, you can show this for yourself just with a, an integral which is, say, a quadratic. So the other interesting thing is that although this uh, little rule is always true, um, that you do get the exact result, you know, the exact result within um, limits of round off, I guess, uh, is, is what the exact result means. Um, if you use uh, integration order that is less than the one that's required to give you the exact result. It might be that you don't get just a bad estimate, you get a completely wrong estimate, right? Not just a, an incrementally bad estimate. And actually this, this, this is exhibited here in this very simple integration. So we're integrating uh, r squared. If you wanted to calculate r squared with one point quadrature, then uh, all quadrature is, is it, let me blow this up so we can see it, it defines the magnitudes of the, um, the locations where you should evaluate something and the, um, the weight that you should add to it. So for one point quadrature, which is this, you calculate the function at r equals 0 and then you multiply by a weight of 2.0. And of course that makes sense because if you look at your geometry between uh, minus 1 and plus 1. All it's saying is you calculate your, whatever your function is it goes through here. You calculate its magnitude here, which is going to be this height, and then you assume that you just multiply that value, and the integral of that curve, the area underneath it, is approximated by the area in that box. That's all, all it's saying. If you have two-point quadrature, which is n equals 2 here, then you calculate the location of the function at plus and minus 0 0.57735026910 etc and so i'm kind of run out of space but the idea is basically that if you want to calculate this function which is doing this between uh, minus 1 and plus 1 including 0, which is where we did it last time. Then you calculate what the function is at this point, which is 0 
point. I should get a less a, bl a less blunt uh, pen, seven seven, and so you calculate graphically this magnitude. Get rid of that box. So in other words, you calculate the function at this point. Can't do it without the box. And then once you have this magnitude, you just draw a box. And you multiply by this total area. So the height of this multiplied by this box is just the function evaluated at 0.577 multiplied by 1. Nothing more than that. And then likewise, minus 0.577 would be here. And so the height of that is this. And then you'd end up with a different box. And so the, the height of those, the, vo the areas of those two boxes added together gives you the integral. So an integral is just a, you know, the area on a curve. It's nothing more than that. If you use three-point quadrature, then you have three locations where you do it. At zero in the middle, and at plus and minus 0 0.774. And the one in the middle, the function is multiplied by 0.888. And so I guess I could draw that if I hadn't already kind of run out of space here. Oh, there was some more space. We can get that on. Yeah, right. So three-point quadrature would look uh, not probably would have been better off with a. So this is again. Let's have our funky function in here, whatever that looks like. Then one point is point zero, and so that's the middle point, and the area over which that extends is point four four on each side, right? So 0.44 here, so that this box here is 0 0.88. And the other ones are going to be the function at evaluated at 0.77. So the other one would be here. This is 0 0.77. This is 1. So this would then be this box, and this length along the top is 0 0.555. So numerical integration, is the concept is really very simple. All it's doing is it's saying that we have a function. We can evaluate that function anywhere we want within these limits, or anywhere else for that matter. But we're going to choose these optimal locations to do it. And those optimal locations are going to be the locations of what are referred to as Gauss points. The Gauss points are, are located in these optimal locations that give us the best result. Uh, don't know, we won't go into the theory behind that. And then once we've calculated the function at those optimal points, we just multiply by the appropriate width of the, of the block that we've calculated, and we multiply the two together. The function multiplied by the block width gives us the magnitude approximated under the curve. Um, and as we use more and more subdivisions, we get better and better approximation. Um, so you'll know that for these, um, these, these must add up to 2, because the interval that we're using always in this is between minus 1 and plus 1. And so if we do this middle one, if you take 0 0.88 and you add twice times 0.555, you should end up with 2. So twice times 0 0.555 is 1.1, 1 .1, and uh, this is almost 0.9, right? So if you add those together, you'd end up with two. So that's all, all of this. So integration is, is pretty straight, straightforward. So that's exactly what we've done here for this, this function. So for r squared, if you want to calculate it, we said um, that if we uh, use two-point quadrature, we'll get the exact result for cubic. A quadratic is one order less than cubic, so we should get the exact result for um, a, a quadratic as well. But we won't get the exact result for if we use one-point uh, quadrature, because that's only good for a linear function. And so if we do that here, we take this function, we evaluate it at the uh, Gauss point. The Gauss point location is r equals 0, right? Remember? So r equals 0 is uh, r, r squared 0 is 0. And so 2 times 0 gives us the integral being equal to 0, which it isn't. Uh, you can calculate what the integral is. And so not only does, well, I guess you could just say that's a really bad estimate. It doesn't seem even close, but it's kind of a, a singular estimate, if you like. If you use two-point quadrature, 
then you calculate the function at plus 0.577, which is just 0.577 squared, multiplied by this weighting function. If we just move it up so you can see this, right? This is the location where we calculate it. This is the magnitude of the weight. This is the location where we at, at evaluate the function, 0.577 squared, multiplied by weight, minus 0.577 squared, multiplied by the weight, and the results we get should be is 0.66. Uh, and if you do that uh, using three-point quadrature, you end up with 0.666 as well. So that's I think that's the exact well, it is the exact result, isn't it? So what is the what should the exact result be? So the integral r squared should be a third r cubed, I suppose, right? Evaluated between um, plus one and minus one, and so that is the same as a third. Is it so? Yeah. So third one. Um, and our well, is that right? Is that is that third r cubed is a third. So uh, r squared is, oh yeah, so it's minus, minus, minus one. Minus, minus one. Is that right? So, so it's third, uh, two over third, two over three, which is exactly this. So we do indeed return the exact uh, solution for that. And so that's it. That's, that's how quadrature, quadrature works. If we want to do it in two dimensions, um, then it gets applied merely to, to do the same thing, uh, again, shown kind of graphically here. But instead of just doing it uh, once, you just take uh, the, the formula for this double integration that we'll have is going to be now not in just in the r direction, but also in the s direction. So we have to calculate the function at these points of these two coordinates. And then we multiply by two weights a weight for the length in one direction, a weight for the length in the other direction, which is just an area. And so if you look at this graphically, it's shown reasonably well here, you keep both things on at the same time. For um, two-point quadrature, this is exactly the solution. So we evaluate the, uh, the functions. So the function now won't be just a, a line above a, a graph. It'll be a, a surface, if you like, above this element. And so what we do is we calculate the magnitude of the um, the function at each of these four locations and then so we calculate each one of these is going to be the function at r i s i and then we just multiply that by whatever the weights the weight is going to be well you know exactly what the weight is right it's one in this direction and it's one in this direction so each one of these, in this particular case, is 1 and 1, and this is whatever the function is. And so you're really just multiplying it through by this, basically, a tributary area, and then you add all four of them up. Um, so two-point quadrature ends up being um, four evaluations, and we know that that works to give an exact result for a cubic um, function. And it turns out that that's usually pretty adequate for, uh, certainly adequate for linear shape functions in this. And uh, you can choose optimal uh, magnitudes to do that. If we want to get better, uh, if we have, say, more uh, severe um, curvature on the, the geometry or in terms of the variables that are represented, we can use higher order quadrature. If we use three point quadrature, then the locations where we evaluate these are exactly the same ones we talked about before in, in 1D, in the, the middle of the range, and at plus and minus 0.77. And then the tributary areas that we apply to these are 0.55 times 0.55. And I guess this middle block here will be 0.888 by 0.888, etc. And so that's, that's all, yeah, I guess that's exactly what this is. I've drawn on this otherwise. So this block is the one that comes out of this central location. And so that's, that's it. And you can use four-point quadrature, and you can use five-point quadrature, and you can use, uh, here it's tabulated for 10-point for quadrature. 
And so obviously there's a penalty in doing this. You get, you'd like to use it so you get the exact result, but you don't necessarily want to use it uh, so that you uh, get more than the exact result because you don't get any extra benefit from it. And so what you need to know is something about what the variation of the function is uh, within the element. And if you know that, you can make um, a good decision as to what order of quadrature you'd use for these two-dimensional elements. And so this is basically making the point for this. And so appropriate orders, levels of quadrature for each of these cases, and this is, of course, relevant to using ComSol as well, is that if you use um, straight-sided, four-noted um, prismatic elements, then two-by-two two quadrature is going to be good enough to get the result, right result. If you use four, ele four noted elements which are distorted, um, then you can probably still get away with it. I mean, these, these are just kind of rules of thumb. Um, this element, of course, is going to be more uh, difficult to evaluate because remember what we talked about in terms of the areas here, that this dx area dx dy we're going to equate to being some function multiplied by the the local coordinates. And so if this element is like this, then you could imagine that everywhere within this element, this determinant of Jacobian, this kind of mapping function, is going to be the same magnitude. It's not going to change. It's going to be uniform. And so the function that we have is going to be partly one, at least one of the terms is going to be close to a constant everywhere in this. The other terms won't be, but one term, this term will be. If you imagine that it's distorted, then it'll change with location. And it will change with location depending on the degree of distortion. So I suppose, well, it'll change, it will be different at this point than it will be at this point because it's being stretched in different ways. And so at least one of the terms that goes into this A matrix um, and also into the overall integral will not be constant within the element. And so these are just rough magnitudes of what the quadrature order should be. If you use an element with mid-side nodes uh, that isn't distorted, then you need three-point quadrature. If it's slightly distorted, uh, you need three-point, you can still get away three-point quadrature. If you have mid-side nodes and a central node as well, you can still get away with this. And if it's distorted, you can still get away with this. And the reason for these all being the same, even if you have uh, distorted elements, is that even as these functions get larger, the, the need to, to jump up a, a level of quadrature is kind of uh, only relative to half the change in the, in the, the power. Right? So we have this function. This, our little rule of thumb is, that, is this. So you get the exact result if it's 2 minus n. So it's twice. So the calculation we did before is with one-point quadrature, we can do linear functions. But with two-point quadrature, we can do cubics. So it means it also includes cubics and also quadratics, which are less. So this, I guess, by inference, means that if we look at this, then three-point would give us what? Three-point would be two threes or six, minus one is five. So it would be the order of the function would be five. So quintic. Quart cubic, quartic, quintic in terms of just the terms. So the maximum power in this function that we're dealing with would, could be a constant but multiplied by r to the power 5. And so that's why uh, it includes, when you look at these uh, suggestions, if you like, for the order of quadrature that you might want to use, this is going to be more challenging than this, but they're both covered by the same order of quadrature because it's accommodating two two. Um, polynomial steps, two, two polynomial powers at a time. So I think that's uh, the reason for that. So it make, makes sense. Um, don't want to talk about that. How are we doing for time? All right. So uh, let's just quickly go through how we might do this in 2D. Um, it's quite, it's moderately straight, well, yeah, it's moderately straightforward for um, flow problems because you'll remember we only have one degree of freedom at each node. So we only have pressure or head at each of the nodes. And so uh, we follow exactly the same uh, plan as we did before. Uh, we have a quadratic, quadrilateral element. We number it typically starting with uh, node 1 being between the local R and S axis. And then numbers then run um, 
counterclockwise. Uh, so you don't have to put an absolute on your determinant of Jacobian, uh, which is uh, we saw in, um, in the example before. Uh, so numbering is always counterclockwise. Um, the element can be distorted in some way. It doesn't really matter. Um, in the global sense, so the x coordinates at, at the nodes for the global nodes, uh, nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the local coordinates in terms of r and s are just plus and minus ones. So that's what we'll work with. Uh, just do that. Okay. So our task is this, is just to be able to figure out what the conductance matrix is. Um, it involves us in being able to make this transformation between global and local coordinate systems with this mapping function, this determinant Jacobian. Uh, the other thing is that we'll use in this A matrix, ultimately, some term like this as well, as we kind of know from what we did with our very simple example. Um, and we need to basically define these mapping functions, the shape functions. We can use these so-called uh, serendipity shape functions again. Just by chance. And they satisfy our requirements. You can check on your own. I won't belabor the point. But if we put, well, we'll do it for one of the points. So in other words, B1 should equal 1 at node 1, and it should equal 0 at all other nodes. So if we look at that in this particular case, I don't know if I can get them both on. It's 1 plus R, 1 plus S. So at node 1, it's going to be 1 plus 1, which is 2, uh, times 1 plus 1, which is 2, multiplied together is 4, and divided by 4, which is 1. So it'll give us 1 at this particular location here, and at all other locations, there'll either be a minus 1 or a plus 1 um, here. So if this is minus 1, then this term is 0, and it's going to be 0. And so if you go around all these other places, because at each of these places, at least one of the coordinates is a minus 1, in one case, both of them, then these values at these other points will be zeros. So in other words, um, we could try drawing it, I suppose, see, see how good my perspective drawing is. So in other words, if uh, we draw the element like this, in perspective, this node here is 1, then <coughs> the shape function looks like this here, it's uh, zero at all these other nodes, and so uh, it'll actually be linear along this edge. It'll be linear along this edge, and I can't redraw really the rest of it through here. So it'll be a surface, if you like, that looks like this. And this would be B1. It's what it looks like as you map it over the whole system. And I suppose I could put this is the R coordinate. This is the S coordinate. Nice. No. Yeah. Maybe since you saw me drawing it, if you looked at that without seeing me drawing it, I'm not sure what you think that was. But you saw me draw it, so I think you probably get a better idea. So those are the individual shape functions that we deal with. Uh, likewise, these uh, other ones for nodes 2, and 3 and 4 satisfy those same requirements. They'll just look differently. And in fact, do you have, um, do you have an idea of this? Back if I don't want to give you whiplash, but I thought we did kind of, did, no, that's exactly what they look like, right? So um, this would be our B1. 1 here, 0 at all the other nodes. And so this would be what our function B1 would look like. B2 would look like this. This is unit height here, and 0 at all the others. And so when you look at these together, they look exactly like this. So that's, that's really all they are. And so the, the only thing that they represent is they allow us to multiply these shape functions by the magnitudes of the heads and get the magnitude of the head at any particular location we want. That's all. That's all they do. And so they're really just 
waiting functions, uh, as they're indeed called. So it's okay. So all right. So so we can use them to do two things. Uh, we can use them to uh, be able to calculate the head at any location as a function of the nodal values of heads. We can use them to calculate the x-coordinate at any location as a function of the nodal values of the coordinates. And we can use them to do the same for in the y direction. So these, this vector here would just be the y-coordinate of node 1, no, y-coordinate of node 2, y-coordinate of node 3, etc. So that's, that's what we use the shape functions to do. We use them to, rep, to kind of map the dependent variable, but also the geometry of the element. And so these equations I've just written here are the same ones that are uh, for equations 3. And so uh, what we're interested in being able to do, you'll remember that we define the A matrix as uh, what? So if you like, in very simple terms, we define the gradients of heads in the x direction as equal to the A matrix multiplied by nodal heads. That's our simplest way. And so we've also written this as in kind of compact form as the derivatives are equal to A times the nodal values. So that's our definition of the A matrix. So the problem is, uh, not the problem, or the reality is, that since these uh, shape functions are defined in with respect to the local coordinates, then it's much easier for us to be able to get the derivatives of these heads, not with respect to x and y, but with respect to the local coordinates r and s. And that's what we did before in the one-dimensional case. And so we need to have them written as this way. We need them with respect to x and y, but we can get them much more easily with respect to r and s using this mapping. So let's get them first with respect to r and s, and then once we've got that, then we'll figure out how to, to get them relative to x and y. And so the easiest way to think about this is that the, we could, for instance, substitute this equation here, which is the same as this equation here, I guess, directly in for this h and for this h. And if we do that, then we can just write this out as this, right? This is the shape function. These are nodal values of heads. And these are just the derivatives of those particular terms. The heads are prescribed only at the nodes, so they don't exist anywhere else in the elements. So they don't vary within the elements. But the shape functions, which we know are functions of R and S, will, be, will have finite derivatives because they have R and S in there. So the derivative with R is just going to be those magnitudes. So what we could do is we could take this P matrix, and what we're interested in is figuring out what the derivatives of these shape functions are with respect to R or S. And you can do it for just one of these terms. This is just the derivative of B1 with respect to R of B1. This is B2, B3, B4, etc. And so you can just zoom, I can't, well, maybe I'll make it small so we can get both at the same time. So B1, the derivative of B1 respect to R is just uh, equal to, this R will be 1 multiplied by 1 plus S. So it'll be a quarter, 1 plus S. Quarters outside, 1 plus S. The derivative of B2 with respect to R is going to be minus 1 times 1 plus S. Minus 1 times 1 plus S multiplied by 4. That's all we're doing. Nothing more uh, involved in that. So we can get the derivatives of those shape functions. And that's now just a, an operator. And so now we have the ability to be able to get the heads with respect to the local gradients. But we need them with respect to this global gradient to be able to make sure that we, we have this matrix. And so we have to figure out exactly how to do that. And it's no different from what we did in the one-dimensional case. It just looks a bit more uh, involved. And that is that we want to figure out exactly what dh dr is. 
And so we could write that as this. And we could write it as, um, perhaps I've written it a bit differently. So we want to get this derivative with respect to r. Uh, we can kind of split it up. We haven't completely violated anything here. So ignore this one on the right-hand side first. Maybe I'll get rid of that. We'll come, it'll come back, but I'll just make this point. So we could write this with respect. We could just multiply this by 1, top and bottom. And 1 top and bottom is just this. So, so certainly this is the case. So this allows us to calculate dx dr and dh dx separately. And we, we, the product of those will give us this, just because we haven't violated that. We could also now add this, or add to this, this other term here. And the reason we can add to this and not get two times this value is that we can add multiply by something which is orthogonal to this. So if x and y are orthogonal to each other, then they don't have any influence on each other individually, and so they're completely separate. And so we're not getting... Um, one of these plus one of these equals two of these because these are independent of each other. So that's all we've done. So it's the chain rule. And so what that allows us to be able to do is we can do that both for dhdr. We can also do the same for dhds and write it out like that. We can also write equation seven as um, a matrix expression where we're just taking out the terms which are the functions of x, which is this term and this term this term and this term, and putting them in here, and leaving the other operators inside this matrix. And this is which we, the thing that we'll magically call the Jacobian. It's, Jacobian is just a matrix of uh, first-order derivatives. A Hessian is second-order derivatives, just a, a term uh, that's applied to it. And it allows us to map between the global coordinate system and the local coordinate system. This is really what it's doing. And so this uh, Jacobian term, we can define this. And the other thing I guess we, we then need to notice is that what we want to do to be able to figure out what this A matrix is, we want to know what the gradients are with respect to the global coordinate directions. But in our case, we only have the results in the local coordinate directions. So we want to do it backwards. So we don't want to use the chain matrix in forward mode, as is suggested here we want to do the opposite. We want to figure out exactly what these global gradients are as a function of these local derivatives, local gradients. And so we want to do the opposite. So we just want to invert it. So this is the inverse of this Jacobian matrix. And so we have just now have the global behavior as a function of the local behavior. This local behavior here is we've already defined the operator that operates on that as this P matrix, which is just the derivatives of the shape functions, right? These are just the derivatives of the shape functions in this P matrix. And so it's a bit involved. But now, by definition, if we're able to get global gradients of heads as a function of nodal values of heads and some operator, then by definition, this operator is just this A matrix. That's it. And so this A matrix, we've been able to figure out this is the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to the local coordinate system. And this inverse of the Jacobian is also going to be a function of these individual, well, it's written below, I guess, these individual terms. And so we can just do that as you would uh, invert any matrix, right? So if you have um, A is equal to A B, C, D, you know that the inverse of that is equal to, what do we do? We get the, the determinant of the, of the matrix, which is, um, am I going to be able to write it in there? It's A, minus, A times D minus B, my, B times C, right? So 1 over A, D minus B, C. And what you do is you flip the terms on the leading diagonal. So this becomes D 
and A, if my memory serves me well, and you take the negative of the terms on the diagonal. So hopefully that's what we have here. So if you can compare um, this matrix here, so these two terms have been switched, switch, dx, dr is here, dy, ds is here. So we take, we switch these two terms and we do the negative of these and that's just the inverse of that matrix. So that's all this is. And so this term here is just the, the determinant of the Jacobian. So this is, this is the Jacobian and this is its determinant. So this is one of the term. I guess the term at the bottom is its determinant. Um, and uh, yeah, and so the individual terms that go in the AD minus BC are just these these terms also. So they're just derivatives. And you see that all of these we're going to be able to get in some way because we know that, for instance, dy ds is just going to be equal to um, the nodal coordinates multiplied by the derivatives of the shape function. Yes. So all these terms that come in this uh, Jacobian are just functions of derivatives of the shape functions. And so that's written out down here. And so the key, it's kind of involved, but the key is that basically we've taken, you know, the big picture is we figured out how to be able to map our heads and our coordinates over the elements. Um, we map them using these shape functions, and we define those shape functions in terms of these local coordinates r and s. Um, once we've figured out what those shape functions are, we can easily take derivatives of those uh, shape functions, local derivatives. But if we do that, then we have to be able to map those to, because we, we need to get the global dh dx and dh dy because that's what uh, defines our behavior. And so really what we've done is we've just used that as a vehicle to be able to figure it out. So there, there are only two important matrices. There's this one which includes all of the derivatives of the shape functions, which is going to be um, a, four, a two by two matrix, um, but with uh, these terms in it. And the only other matrix is this P matrix, which is one that maps um, heads onto local gradients of heads. And so it's just the derivatives of the shape functions. And so we can figure out what those exactly be. This is absolutely defined for this case, for these particular um, mapping functions, shape functions. And so is the, uh, the relationship here for the, the determinant, the, Jacob the Jacobian. And so what are we left with? So the, I guess the, uh, the end point is we want to be able to map get gradients of heads as a function of nodal heads. The operator that links these by definition, by our own definition, is this A matrix, and it's just the product of these two matrices. One which is the derivatives of the shape functions, one which is uh, the derivatives of the coordinates, if you like, or the geometry uh, that has some kind of simple uh, explanation. So once we have that, we can put together everything we need to for our own particular element. We've got a few minutes to, to do this. Um, let's just talk in, in overview about this. So certainly we can get this A matrix. We know what it is. It's a function of derivatives of shape functions. It's getting kind of complicated in this Jacobian. And so rather than integrate this analytically, we can't. We have to do it numerically. And so all we need to do is being able to evaluate these particular functions at the individual Gauss points. And once we have that, we calculate what the magnitudes are. We multiply by the tributary areas. Um, we talked about this, uh, the Jacobian and its determinant. You remember, we've never really derived this, but we, you know that we, this whole thing here maps the global coordinate systems onto the local ones. So you can think about this in terms of the individual components. And so, for instance, this little analysis down here is what happens if you have um, a global element which is 10 by 10, say. I don't know what the number is. And you have a local element. So this is G for global. And we have a local element, which is 2 by 2. And so this is 
x and y. It's useful to kind of think of these things as to what they physically mean. This is r, and I can only just get s in here. Then what do, what do these derivatives mean? Right? So what does dx dr mean? So dx would be a small length in this direction. Right? Go away. And it would be a small length. And y would be this. And I can't really do it here, but this is going to be dr, right? So if you look at these in a, in a simple way, so what's the, the ratio dx dr going to be in this particular case? Well, x in its limit is going to be 10. r in its limit is 2. So this would be 5. So it's the stretching that you have to do to be able, or the shrinking, I suppose, actually. The shrinking you have to do to be able to get the global element down onto, no, to get the local element up to the global element. It's the stretching you have to do. If you look at dy ds, they're aligned in the same direction, so they're one to one, so this again would be 10, and this would be 2, so this would be 5. What are the off, off diagonal terms? So the ratio of dx ds, so dx is in this horizontal direction, a length, but ds is orthogonal to that, right? Because these are unrotated. And so the component of x in the s direction, by definition, is 0. And so these off-diagonal terms end up being uh, lobes. And so if you work out what the determinant of this Jacobian is, if we have it here, uh, this is dx dr, what do we say? Uh, we said that this, is, this was 5. We said that this was 5. We said that this was 0. And we said that this was 0. So that's exactly, I mean, physically what this means is if you want to go from the local coordinate system to the global coordinate system in terms of mapping those areas, one is 25 times larger than the other. The multiplier of 25 is because you're fitting, I was going to do it on the board, you're fitting this geometry here, which is 10 by 10, and you're fitting inside that something which is 2 by 2. And so there are five of these along this axis, five of these along this axis. So the, 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 the ratio of the two areas is 25. That's, that's really all that term means. And so it's good to be able to think about these in terms of physically, physically what that means. Yeah. Right. right, that's it. Time's up. Um, for next time, next time we, well, we, actually we got exactly where we wanted to be. So next time we've talked so far about uh, steady state analysis. So what we'll talk about next time is how we do time steps by integrating in time, basically. And so we'll add that to our list of techniques. Once we've done uh, steady state, transient, isoparametric elements, and regular elements for flow, then we've really done it for, it's, there are very simple modifications that have to be applied to do solid mechanics, and to do Navier-Stokes flow, and to do advective transport. Those are just wrinkles, if you like, on top of that. So once we get through the stuff that we'll talk about next time, then we you know, we covered one very significant portion of the co course, and then applying this to mechanical behavior, Navier-Stokes flow, transport of heat and solutes by vection, is is uh, is a small wrinkle on top of that, and then we can start once we understand those systems, start combining things together so that they interact. That's, that's kind of where we go. Okay.